So today we're going to start uh, chapter two. Um, so we'll talk about we'll talk about the frequency ranges and the uh, the, the characteristics of the Wi-Fi signal in the different frequency range. And this is this is very very important. This is one of the basic fundamentals that will possibly allow us to understand so many things about why they use different ranges for different systems. Um, so the basic fundamental idea is that if you look here, we know that the multiplication of the wavelength by the frequency is actually the, the speed of light. Speed of light is, is this, uh, 3 times 10 to the power 8 meter per second. So the, the, um, the wavelength of the signal and the frequency of the signal, they have this relationship here, right? Um, which means that here we can have very, very low frequency, okay? And very large uh, uh, wavelength. Whereas here, we have the other way around. So, so from here to here, what happens to the wireless signal? So we want to really understand what are the main characteristics of the wireless signal that will actually allow us to find the best frequency range for the different systems. So first, here, if, of course, if we multiply any of these numbers, we'll get the speed of light, right? Uh, so that's, that's obvious. Um, so here we have the very low frequency range. Very f low frequency range ranges from 300 hertz uh, to possibly around uh, uh, a few tens of, uh, of kilohertz. The, 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 uh, this, um, this range, in this range of frequency, the wireless signal is capable of penetrating through any obstacles, okay? And that's why this range is actually very useful for submarine communication. So uh, in this range, the, the wireless signal has the characteristic that uh, you have one million meter. So the wavelength itself is very, very large, okay? And this allows the wireless signal to penetrate through any obstacles. And that's why in this very low range, they use it for submarine communication or for some wired communication like coaxial, okay? Um, they use it for submarine communication because for submarine, of course, we communicate underwater and we need the wireless signal to penetrate through the water and not only that, to penetrate through any objects underneath the ocean. Okay? When, when, when we increase, the more we increase the frequency, the shorter the wave will become, right? In terms of wavelength. Mm -hmm. And that allows the, uh, uh, the signal, the wireless signal, to diffuse uh, easily. So the shorter the wavelength is, the wireless signal becomes more, uh, when, when the wireless signal moves like this, it diffuses in different directions. And if there is any obstacle, it just reflects from this obstacle. It does not penetrate. Okay? So it reflects from this obstacle very easily. And it creates some kind of... Um, of what we call multipath fading, okay? Uh, because the, the different versions of the wireless signal goes through different direction and it reflects through different objects easily. It does not penetrate easily. It does not penetrate. It just reflects and it, it creates like multipath of the same wireless signal. And that creates a very uh, tricky uh, environment. So multipath fading is like when different signals meet? It's, the, it's actually the same copy of the signal, but it just goes through different directions. Ah, okay. And the same copy, when it, when it reflects, it actually changes the phase of the signal a little bit. So what you get here, it's actually not in phase copies of the signal. They get shifted a little bit. So it's, it can cancel each other or it can... It can it can actually create some kind of noise, uh, 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 even though it's the same copy of the signal. So 
supposedly when I get the same copy of the signal here, it should actually uh, uh, make the wireless signal stronger. But in fact, this reflection changes the phase of the signal. So what you get here is a delayed signal. Okay, because the one copy of the signal went all, uh, in a straight line, the other one reflected. So this reflection creates some kind of a delay. So what you get here is unidentical copies of the signal, which creates, so if you are sending a, a signal like this, what you get here is actually something like this. Why? Because this is a composite signal which is a result of multiple copies of the same uh, uh, signal but with some delay shifts okay and the higher the frequency is the more this effect will become okay so this is one characteristic the higher the frequency is the the the, the more uh, uh, sensitive the wireless signal will be uh, uh, with respect to uh, obstacles that creates multipath fading. Okay? So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that uh, we need to know that the, <coughs> the power of the signal is proportional to 1 over the frequency square. Okay? And what was it here? The power of the signal. Which means that which means that the signal, if it has higher frequency, it loses power much faster. It loses power much faster. So, if you have a wireless signal in the frequency range 2.4 gigahertz, okay, which is the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi uses actually 2.4 gigahertz. So, for a particular channel of Wi-Fi, you can measure the range and you can find it around maybe like 50 meters or something, okay? If you were to uh, use 5 gigahertz, which is another version of Wi-Fi, you will find that the range drops even less than half. Why is that? Because when the frequency increases, the wireless signal tends to lose the power much faster. Okay? So that's another uh, characteristic that affects the wireless signal in uh, uh, in high frequency. So this is very important, right? So when we when we increase the when we increase the, the, the frequency, we should keep into consideration the fact that we will have to deal with multipath fading, mm -hmm. and we'll have to be aware that the wireless signal loses the, the power much faster. So the question here, so why bother? So let's just use low frequency for all, for all the systems, right? So why bother? So it turns out that there are some challenges in low frequency ranges which inhibits the fact that we can design wireless systems in this range. One of them is really fundamental, which is related to hardware, by the way, which is the fact that we, we will talk about this in more details later. The antenna of the, of the wireless is actually proportional to the wavelength. So can you imagine that when you have a, a range of frequency, 300 hertz, or in other words, the signal would have very, very long wavelength, one million meter. So imagine that you design an antenna with a length which is half this. It's, 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 it's just, you need to build, you need to have a building, a huge building, right? So it's not, it's not possible. Um, so that's why we can, we have to have like higher frequency so that the antenna design would be, would be small and we can have efficient uh, electromagnetic wave from the antenna in a reasonable frequency uh, 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 without having to have this huge design or huge form factor of the antenna. Okay, so it's it's just not uh, possible to afford um, 
the antenna design in low frequency, unless we're talking about, you know, like for submarine communication, of course you can have, you can have a submarine um, with huge antenna and stuff. So it's possible. So, but it cannot be done in a very low scale. It, 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 it just cannot be done. Or for wire, for wire, we don't have antenna. For coaxial communication, we don't have antenna. So it's fine. Um, but the, the problem is the antenna design itself. Okay, we'll talk about this in a, in a few minutes. So, so now we know the characteristic of the wireless signal when we increase uh, the frequency. And we know how challenging it is in, 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 in the different frequency range. Uh, so we we'll discussed two uh, characteristics of a wave. One is multi-path fading. Right. And the other one is like loses power when we increase the frequency. Right, 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 right. So, um, so now we'll talk about each range and what it's used for and, and possibly why. And we can motivate why 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 is this frequency range used for uh, for our specific systems? So as we said here, we're using for submarine communication, and we talked about this. Here, the, the antenna design is huge, and uh, we can uh, we can afford some of this. Uh, here, we're talking about. Um, so as, uh, here, we know that the, the the communication range can get in the range of you know maybe 100 kilometers or um, huge. As we said, the wireless uh, uh, signal in that, in that range of frequency tends to have very long range and it can penetrate through any obstacles. So you can have very, very long uh, range communication in this wireless um, range, in this uh, frequency range. Um, starting from here, we, we start to talk about uh, um, low frequency. For in the low frequency range, um, we have uh, AM, you know, amplitude modulation, the AM channels, uh, radio channels. Again, the, the, the range for these uh, audio channels is, uh, is again, is, 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 is huge. Um, so, for example, you can listen to the radio from uh, a radio station from Dubai or from Iran. And you, can, you can tune to that. So that gives you the, the range of communication that you could have. It's, it's huge. Um, but, of course, again, the challenge here is the... Uh, that's why we have radio stations, huge. Antenna design is huge. Mm -hmm. not, not huge as this, but it's still, it's, it's, it's really big. Um, <clears throat> so go, moving up, you have uh, uh, what we call <coughs> FM. So FM works in the range of um, around 88. Um, so here, somewhere here. So here you have uh, from 88 uh, megahertz all the way to 108 megahertz. Um, so this is used for FM, you know FM, of course. FM radio stations as well. Um, here, the, 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 bandwidth, the bandwidth of the signal is a little bit larger uh, due to some frequency modulation, which we will talk about. And again, the range here is a little bit shorter compared to AM, but it's still, it's still large enough for... Uh, uh, long range communication for FM. Okay, uh, going up in the range of uh, one gigahertz and two gigahertz, we start to have what we call uh, uh, IMF band, or we start to have most of the um, digital communication systems that we know about today. So, in the range of around, oh, actually, actually, before that, we have from uh, nine nine hundred megahertz, we have many, many versions of uh, GSM and uh, um, the cordless telephone uh, standards that we talked about, the amps. In this range, we start to have reasonable size antenna, reasonable size, so starting from 9 megahertz, we start to have a reasonable size antenna, um, and that's why they start, they, they use it for uh, G2 and G1 uh, wireless cellular uh, standards that we talked about last time. We talked about AMPS, uh, first generation, and we talked about uh, cordless telephony, and we talked about uh, GSM, which is G2. So in the range of uh, nine, 900 megahertz, we start to have uh, these uh, standards. Um, <clears throat> above this, we get to around... Um, 
in the range of uh, 2.4 gigahertz. In this range around here, uh, the 2.4 gigahertz is the most crowded uh, frequency range. Uh, so we'll talk about why is this. But actually, most of the most of the Wi-Fi standards and uh, some Bluetooth uh, versions and Zigbee as well, they work in this range. Um, the advantage of this range is that uh, they call it unlicensed band. So the frequency around the 2.4 gigahertz is unlicensed band. What, what does that mean? The regulator, the regulatory um, uh, body worldwide, they, they have to, uh, to uh, restrict the different frequency ranges and actually they do some bidding and they, people will actually buy this and they, they actually pay billions of dollars in some cases to just manufacture devices and use specific frequency range. So it's not left up to anyone to design any device in any frequency range and, and, and consume the, this frequency range with uh, some wireless communication. It's not, it has to be regulated. So um, the good thing about 2.4 is that uh, it's unlicensed uh, licensed in the sense that you do not have to pay something to use that, uh, uh, that frequency range. You don't have to, use, to, to pay something which means that you can manufacture devices in this range without having to pay something, okay? Um, but so you have it's to take permission. free, but you have to take permission, probably. So, yes, exactly, you have to take permission, but you don't have to pay something, okay? Um, so still, it's regulated in the way, but it's unlicensed in the sense that there is no license fee, okay? So that's why this range of frequency is very crowded, and you see that even microwaves, they run in this frequency range. Um, some Wi-Fi communication. Uh, most of the Wi-Fi standards, they, they use this uh, 2.4 uh, gigahertz. So it's, it's a free uh, range of communication. Um, so in that frequency range, of course, the, the wireless signal diffuses a lot and there is, a, there is, a, there is so much uh, um, limitation when it comes to multipath fading and... and but the good thing about this is that the antenna design tends to be very, very, very small. Um, so that you can imagine that we have maybe eight antenna in this. So you have multiple antenna, actually. It's not actually one antenna here. Um, it's very, very tiny. Um, so you can have very sophisticated antenna design in that range in a very, very small scale. Okay. Um, of course, the wireless range the range of communication is dictated by two things. It's dictated by the frequency and the power of transmission that you use. So uh, uh, if, if you have higher frequency, the, the signal tends to lose power uh, uh, faster. So if I start with very large transmission power, then I can increase the range, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this, the signal goes like from a very high power and then it, it goes like this. Okay, so if I want to increase the range, either I reduce the frequency or I increase the transmission power. So that's what they use here. So they use uh, transmission power to dictate certain communication uh, range. Okay. Okay, so um, above, above the, in, in the range of uh, 10 gigahertz and, and things like this, the wireless signal it tends to diffuse a lot. So if you if you use if you use uh, what we call isotropic antenna um, to to send the wireless signal in multiple directions, as we will see in a minute, you will not have any good communication. So in the range of microwave uh, micro uh, uh, wavelength, uh, or mil they call it uh, millimeter wave, starting from here. They call it millimeter wave. Um, in that case, the only way to have good communication is, is what we call li uh, line of sight. Okay? Line of sight. Where the signal does not go in, in all directions. It has to be directed in a specific direction. So what's, what's good and bad about this? The good thing is that 
when you point the wireless signal in a specific direction, the good thing is that you are focusing all the power in one direction, which allows the wireless signal to go, again, uh, longer distance. So that's good. The other thing is that um, the, 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 the communication will happen more efficiently if, if the other receiver is on the same line uh, which I'm sending the, uh, the wireless signal through. Okay, so if you have the receiver on the other side, it will be able to receive very high quality uh, signal and I will not suffer from any uh, multipath fading or anything, right? Because I'm not sending the wireless signal through obstacles in that case. I'm directing the wireless signal. What's bad about this is that I can easily block the entire communication if I put something in the middle, <laughs> right? So if you put something in the middle, you, you, you break the whole thing, right? The other thing is that if the receiver is not on the same line of sight, you will not get any communication. This is similar to what? This is similar to infrared communication if we have remote uh, controls at home. If you direct it this way, you will not, you will not control the, the TV. Why? Because it uses very high frequency in the range of, we call it here, infrared range. In the infrared range, you have to have line of sight communication. Otherwise, if you send the wireless signal in multiple directions, you will not get any communication because the multipath fading effect will dominate in that case. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so, up until uh, uh, um, 30 gigahertz or something, well, you can we, can, we can argue that you can have some isotropic antenna and you can have some communication using multipath fading. Above that, you have to have line of sight. So anything above this works based on line of sight. What works it based on? Up to 30 gigahertz. Up to around 30 gigahertz or maybe even less than that. Uh, you can have multipath, you can have communication and mitigate multipath fading. So even if you have multipath fading, the effect of multipath fading will not dominate and you can have some uh, uh, wireless communication, which means that you have, you have good throughput. Above this limit, you have to have line of sight communication. Line of sight communication is that the transmitter and the receiver are on the same line of sight. Okay? This is still wireless, but the wireless signal goes into one line. And this line is supposedly not blocked. Okay? And it's not going in multiple directions. So it's actually in one straight line. They use this, by the way, uh, uh, to to, to create, we, we call it microwave links. So the, the base station towers, the base station towers that cover uh, 4G and 3G and things like that, these towers, they can have microwave communication between them. Okay? Uh, and the, the, the base station to base station communication happen, happens using microwave links in very, very high frequency range. So... Because these towers are really you know, use very high altitude, so they can have line of sight communication. Mm -hmm. So in that in that range and that altitude, you can have very good wireless uh, channel quality, and you can adjust the transmission power to have suitable range of communication between the the base stations. So in that case, you can have very good communication in 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 that high uh, frequency. Okay. Uh, and uh, why we use microwave links and not use 2.4? Well, because well we have you have um, you have of course very high towers, okay, and each of these towers they provide communication to users, right? So if you these users from these users to the base station, we use 2.4 uh, gigahertz, right? If we use the same frequency range between uh, the two base stations, what will happen is that there will be some interference between the communication here and the communication for the users, right? If we use microwave links, then we separate and isolate the communication between the base stations from the communication between the base station and the users. You see that? So the, the, there will be no interference between this link and the links to the to the, the the users between uh, that that get associated to this base station. Uh, 
clear my career means 300 megahertz to no free no in the in the in the range of 30 gigahertz in yes in the, they call it millimeter wave <clears throat> so in that uh, range you can have line of sight communication between the base stations the good thing about that is that uh, remember if we don't have this line of sight communication what is what is the what is the alternative you need we need to have wired backbone mm -hmm. between these base stations mm -hmm. there's no other way but will be very expensive to dig wires and stuff and connect all these uh, base stations. To. So what happens is that from the, the base stations, you can have microwave length and you can connect very, very few number of base stations okay, with the wired backbone. And between the, the other base stations together, you can have microwave lengths. So microwave lengths acts as an extension to the wired backbone because it's, it's actually, it's like wired because it's line of sight but it's done using wireless, okay? And nowadays, we we're also talking about even visible light. So, uh, especially in uh, nowadays, they're talking about using visible light uh, for communication. So, visible light, of course, is, the, is what we call like ultraviolet uh, or uh, ultra, you know, this is called ultraviolet. Mm -hmm. So, this visible light, of course, visible light is what we see, but, it, how do we use this for communication is, is, is really challenging. Um, but it, it turns out that we can have some optical wireless communication. So we can actually use this microwave length using visible light. But in that case, the visible light will be like a laser beam between the two base stations. But in a very, very high frequency, we call it ultraviolet frequency. Okay? So in any case, uh, in, the, in, the, in the range of tens of gigahertz, we always tend to use line of sight communication, okay? Less than that, we can tolerate some multipath fading. Uh, and uh, in, in the very low frequency, we can have very, very long range communication. And we don't have any issues when it comes to multipath fading because the signal tends to penetrate any obstacle uh, and it goes in a very, very long range of communication without uh, being affected by multipath. Okay. The distance between those two BTS, is, is there any limitation for us if, it, if it is? Uh, it? We're talking here about maybe one kilometer, uh, in the range of one kilometer. And again, mm -hmm. you can adjust the transmission power to dictate the range, right? So if we want to increase the range, what we need yeah. to do is to, to increase the transmission power from these base stations to increase the range. But of course, it's not advisable to keep them very, very far apart because in that case, you will spend a huge amount of power. And remember that uh, these uh, base stations are usually powered by, like, um, they call it uh, generator, uh, power generators, which are, get fed by oil and stuff like that. So it's... it's uh, it's also not very green and not very advisable to, to use huge amount of transmission power. So the range uh, is like maybe one kilometer maximum. So there will be like one base station every one kilometer? Yeah, that's... Pretty much, yes. But, you know, um, in, in the whole area, you can cover the whole area of Doha. Doha is like, uh, you're talking about maybe, I, I don't know, like maybe 100 base stations maximum. Mm -hmm. It covers the whole area of Doha. Which is which is doable. Mm -hmm. So you can cover a whole city with this with this setting in with a reasonable amount of cost. Mm -hmm. Okay? So any question because this this, <coughs> this slide is, is really um, very important. It gives us really a, a snapshot and, and a, a, a good fundamentals about the different characteristics of the wireless signal in different frequency ranges. After that uh, submarine transmission. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what why is that the twisted pair the means of communication is through uh, the cable twisted pair cable huh? what is that you well what what this says is that in this range of frequency you can have communication through twisted pair so twisted pair you know the twisted pair yeah. you know that yeah. so twisted pair is wire it's not wireless yeah. okay it is okay wired. Uh -huh. yes and uh, this the the characteristic of the line 
can carry frequency from very very low frequency all the way until uh, 300 megahertz okay so this line physically can carry a range of frequency from very very low frequency all the way to 300 megahertz okay but this does not get affected by antenna design or things because this is not wireless right uh, similarly also coaxial works in this range of frequency mm -hmm. it's slightly higher compared to twisted pair mm -hmm. but this is because of the physical characteristics of the coaxial you know the coaxial is like yeah. one thick wire and it's and just it's uh, shield shield with shielded Small with the, of cables yes yeah. yes mm -hmm. but the twisted pair is like very th thin wires mm -hmm. and it has multiple of them mm -hmm. okay so the physical characteristic of that uh, of these types of wires allows it to have frequency range in this in this range but this is not wireless mm -hmm. so it does not it's not affected by antenna design or any multipath fading or anything like that okay and then submarine communication if we put one antenna in one portion of say an ocean then how was how was it like uh, how many distance um, few kilometers okay so we're every... talking about maybe maybe up to 50 kilometers you can have 50 kilometer communication range which is huge. Okay. So every 50 kilometer you need to put it yeah. in the ocean? Yes, in the ocean, yes. And in that case, the wireless signal tends to penetrate through the water and tends to penetrate through any obstacles and stuff like that. It has the characteristic that allows it to do that. So you can have very long range communication in a very hazardous environment that's full of you know uh, objects and stuff because the, the, the wireless signal will, will not lose its power very fast mm -hmm. and it would penetrate it does not reflect and create multipath fading it actually penetrates through the because of the because the because of the long wavelength mm -hmm. because the long wavelength allows the wireless signal to penetrate through any object okay. this antenna is i mean the antenna is above the ocean head no like it's no 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 under under underneath yes that? So this immersed communication, everything is done with this or it is satellite. Well, it well it depends. Uh, you can have you can have you can have um, above water communication to the underwater system, but usually what happens is that um, under marine communication happens through possibly multiple stations, and then there is one station onshore, which. Uh, 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 takes all the information from the the under uh, submarine communication to the onshore and, and get the communication um, uh, to you know to some centralized system or something like this. So the from the under marine communication to the onshore, they use different types of antenna. But what we're talking about here is that if you were to use submarine communication, the transmitter and the receiver are underwater. And you can have very, very low frequency communication, and this allows you to have very, very long range underwater. So even the water will not affect the wireless signal. Okay. Because in, in, in normal cases, if you increase the frequency a little bit, the, the, the wireless signal tends to reflect from the water surface. Mm -hmm. The same effect of multipath fading. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have any difference, uh, walls or any difference between water and air and things like that this allows the wireless signal to deflect and reflect and and it has all kind of effect and that creates the multipath fading effect so um, but in very very low frequency range you don't have that so you can have reliable communication underwater but the only limitation here is the antenna design it has to be huge and we'll talk about this in a second so these are the ranges of frequencies that are used. Of course, you don't, we don't have to memorize this, but this is just to um, show you that, uh, in general, <coughs> the, uh, the regulatory or the regulation body worldwide is called the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, and there is a, there is a subgroup uh, called radio, radio, uh, uh, radio Communication, uh, which... Um, organizes the use of different frequency bands across the world. So countries, they have to bid on specific frequency range to be used. And by countries, I mean the major uh, carriers of this country, like 
for our case here, we have Uridu, we have Vodafone. They actually bid on certain uh, frequency range to be used in their in their network, and usually they they pay actually hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to use specific frequency range. Um, so uh, GSM uh, from the from ITUR perspective, GSM can can be used in different ranges, and uh, and it's up to the carrier in this country to use one 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 uh, specific range of frequency. Of course. Why not other frequency ranges? Because GSM as a standard, it actually allows certain constraints on the wireless signal uh, because this, this has to do with how the GSM is designed. <clears throat> the way that GSM is designed allows the wireless signal to be in, in this frequency, in the, in the big frequency range, so they divide this frequency range into sub-channels uh, and they allocate these channels to different countries or different carriers and things like that. So GSM is G2, is, is second generation, whereas UMTS is, a, is, dish, is G3, as we said last time, and then LTE is 3.5 and 4G. Okay? Uh, cordless phones, they use this frequency range. As you can see, the, the 900 megahertz range is, is pretty crowded, but the most crowded one is from 2.1 to 2.4 gigahertz. This seems to be the most crowded uh, uh, part, uh, especially here, for 802.11, 802.11b, all of them, they use, they use 2.4, okay? And forget about other RF systems, these use different uh, frequency ranges, okay? But the, uh, all, most of the wireless LAN standards, whether it's 802.11, 802.15, and for Bluetooth and Zigbee, and all of them, they use... 2.4. Some of them they use 2.4 and 5 gigahertz interchangeably, so they can change from 2.4 to 5 gigahertz. But uh, uh, but most of them they use 2.4. Okay. And one thing we noticed, and we did some measurements actually using hardware on 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 the frequency range for 2.4 versus 5 gigahertz, and you can you can see clearly that when you when you when you increase the frequency, you drop the uh, the range of communication right away. So this uh, this this frequency range it can be uh, the same frequency cannot can be allotted to different countries no yes 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 no? yes can yeah so different countries they are allowed to use but there has to be some again uh, some regulations when it comes to uh, roaming from one country to another and what frequency because this affects even the the the, the phone mm -hmm. because some phones they they are constrained with the with the frequency ranges that they use. So if I use a specific um, frequency range, if I roam from one country to another, I won't be able to communicate. Mm -hmm. So the frequency range that each country uh, uh, allocate, uh, allocates uh, affects the, the roaming capability from one country to another. But yes, of course, uh, multiple countries can use the same, the same frequency range. Of course, yes. <clears throat> okay, so going, going even lower level, uh, from the signal perspective. So we can study signals. And uh, uh, as we know, from a physical layer perspective, signals are, well, for computers, we'll de we're dealing with ones and zeros, right? But at the end of the day, what we send over the wireless, uh, whether it's antenna or wires, what we actually essentially send on these uh, media is, a, is signals, analog signals, right? So... Um, the analog signals are the physical representation of data, right? So at the end of the day, we have to send analog signals. Um, so these analog signals are function of um, time and location. So at specific location, we have a specific, and a specific time, we have certain amplitude, certain frequency, and so on. The signal parameters, um, uh, represent the value of the data. So I can represent ones and zeros using the amplitude of the signal or using the frequency of the signal or using the phase of the signal. So these are the, the, the three fundamental parameters of the signal. We have the amplitude and we have the frequency and we have the phase. So these are the three major parameters in any uh, signal. 
So the signal itself can be continuous uh, uh, in time or discrete in time. So we have discrete signal and we have continuous signal. Um, it could be continuous in value and discrete in value. And we can have any combination between this and this. So it could be continuous, continuous time, continuous value. Or continuous time, discrete value. Or discrete time, continuous value. And so on. Uh, so, the, so we can have any combination of these. So this, this actually gives us uh, four combinations. Analog signal, we usually, we usually uh, refer to analog signals as continuous time, continuous value. Which means that the signal is like, <coughs> is like this. So it has, it has no restriction on the value at any point in time. And it has no restriction on a specific uh, 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 time. So it's not like discrete signal like this. This is, this is a discrete signal. But the amplitude of the signal itself is, is continuous. It could have any value. Right? Versus if you have a signal like this. So this, this signal is continuous in time, but discrete in value. It's because the values themselves, they can have uh, uh, specific discrete values. It's not like continuous. So at, at any point in time, it cannot just change the value. Uh, it has to remain constant within certain uh, 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 values. So it, it, it's not allowed to take any value at any point in time. It can have certain values only, okay? So this is continuous time, discrete value. Okay, so, <clears throat> so by analog signal, we, uh, we, we, uh, we mean a continuous time, continuous values. By digital signals, we uh, usually refer to discrete time and discrete values, right? So the signal parameters are, as we said, amplitude, frequency, and phase. So, uh, so this is the, uh, uh, the, some examples of a sine wave, which is a, uh, the simplest example of uh, an analog signal. But this analog signal has a specific characteristic that it's, it's actually periodic. And it's periodic in the sense that it, it actually repeats its time, repeats itself, sorry, uh, each specific period of time. And this period of time is, is T, capital T, okay? Um, it turns out that Fourier uh, uh, is a scientist, and he actually uh, came up with the theory that any periodic signal like this, this is a periodic digital signal, okay? Uh, any periodic signal like this can be represented by finite set of sine waves, like this, okay? So there is a DC component, and there is multiple sine and cosine waves. The cosine is actually sine, but it's shifted uh, pi over 2, right? So in a way, it's sine, but it's shifted pi over 2. Um, so by multiple sine and cosine uh, uh, waves, and it's finite in the sense that it's actually discrete in the frequency domain. So representing the periodic signal in the frequency domain is discrete. Okay, so I can map this periodic signal. So in, if I were to uh, uh, map this to the frequency domain, so it will be, this is the DC component, so this is C over 2. Okay, and then AN, so this is A1, A2, A3, and so on. Okay, and this is B1, B2, and so on. So it's like discrete, which means that this periodic signal has discrete frequency components in the frequency domain. Okay, if it's aperiodic, if this signal is aperiodic, which means that it's, it's not periodic, right, then... This, these samples, they will not be samples. This would be continuous frequency, uh, 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 continuous frequency signal. 
Okay, so this is basically Fourier theory. So Fourier theory is like we can represent periodic signals in the frequency domain using discrete samples in the frequency domain. If it's a periodic signal, these samples will become continuous. They will not be like discrete samples. They will be continuous uh, signal in the frequency uh, domain. Okay. So why is this? Uh, because simply, if that's the case, then in hardware, we tend to deal with frequency much more efficiently in the hardware because, because, of, the, because of the efficient design of filters and stuff like that. Uh, we can deal with uh, frequency components much more efficiently in hardware. Okay? So using a digital uh, a periodic signal like this, we can represent this digital signal using finite or very low number of uh, periodic frequency components using sine wave signals. And we can take these samples and deal with these samples to represent this digital signal. So instead of transferring this digital signal, we can deal with these frequency components only. And by the way, in, 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 in the actual hardware implementation, we can, we can find that many of these frequency components, they will be almost zero. They will be negligible. So representing a digital signal like this, you can represent it using uh, maybe two or three frequency components in the frequency domain. That's it, <coughs> which, is, which, is, which is much more efficient. So we can deal with, the, uh, uh, with, with this uh, signal representation in the frequency domain more efficiently. Uh, below one is time domain and the discrete values which we entered is in the frequency domain. Right, yeah, this is frequency, yes. This is frequency, this is time. So pushing or converting from the time to the frequency domain, we, 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 we do that using Fourier transform. Okay? So instead of, instead of sending this digital signal on the, uh, on, the, on the wired line or the wireless line, we actually convert into the frequency domain and then send these samples. That's what we do. Send these samples in the... Uh, uh, on the on the wired or the wireless line, and we can use some filters to make sure that anything above certain frequency we can just neglect it, and we can have some good approximation of 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 these uh, signals. And on the receiver side, we can do the reverse operation. We can do some channel estimation and some, uh, 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 and uh, and signal detections to get back this digital signal very accurately with ideal. Uh, uh, representation, okay, using some uh, signal uh, estimation techniques, okay. So there are different ways of representing uh, this signal. One of them, of course, is the is the time domain or the amplitude domain. So we can represent any wireless signal in the time domain by showing the amplitude in different times. Right, and, uh, and this so this is the amplitude, and this is the time, okay. Or we can convert this signal into the frequency domain. Uh, the frequency domain, as you can see, it shows us this is this this is this is actually proportional to the amplitude of the signal, right? And this is the frequency, which is the frequency of this signal. The frequency, as you, as we know, is the a is, is the number of periods in a, in a time unit, in a, in a unit of time, which is second. So what is the number of periods in a specific time, in a specific unit of time, which is one second? So if we have 300 uh, periods of, of this in, in one second, we say that the, uh, the frequency is 300 hertz, and so on, right? Um, so the, the location of this signal on the frequency shows us the frequency of the signal. What's not represented here is what is the phase. So in the frequency domain, we do not or we cannot represent the phase. So that's one limitation in the frequency spectrum of the signal.
okay and that's why we always use the frequency domain representation together with what we call phase state diagram phase state diagram so this phase state diagram shows us the in phase and quadrature phase components of the signal the in phase and quadrature phase component of the signal for example this sine wave the black one can be represented simply by one line here and this amplitude this part is equal to this part and the fact that I put it on the on the x-axis here this means that there is no phase shift in this signal here there's no phase shift mm -hmm. which means that it starts from zero with an amplitude of zero so there is no phase shift okay this signal the red one is represented here so again the, uh, the, 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 the distance or the amplitude here is the amplitude here mm -hmm. right and this phase shift is this angle here okay so again what's missing here is the frequency component so this phase state diagram and this is the frequency diagram so that phase shift is pi by 2 I mean, 90, 90 degree phase shift between the purple and the blue color no? Yeah, it's pretty much, yes, it's pi over 2, which means that it's cosine, it's a cosine wave. It's, it's sort of a cosine wave, yes. This, this one is, is sort of a cosine wave. But regardless, I mean, we, any phase shift mm -hmm. we will, will, will be mapped into an angle here. That angle will be 90 degree, I mean, approximately. Yes, <laughs> it will be, yes, yes. Here, it's, uh, in, in, in that case, if this is pi over 2, then... This will be um, here. Yeah, that's it. If it's exactly pi over 2, so it will be here. Okay? So this angle is the phase shift here. Okay? So, as we said, digital signals, in general, they need infinite frequencies, infinite frequency components for perfect representation of the signal, right? Because this, the, the discrete components in the frequency domain, they tend to have infinite number. But um, we actually use certain approximation to uh, 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 approximate the signal in the transmitter side. And on the receiver side, we can use some channel estimation and channel detection to get back the original digital signal, okay? So, there is another aspect which is modulation. Modulation uh, talks about the fact that, uh, what in, uh, uh, as we said, for GSM and the different standards, we need to, we need to restrict the signal in a frequency range which is regulated by ITUR, right? So, in the transmitter, what we do is that after we convert to the frequency domain, what we do is that we do modulation to shift the signal in the frequency range that, that is allowed for us for communication, right? Because if we, if we don't do modulation, we end up with what we call baseband. Mm -hmm. And baseband is like the signal is in low frequency range, let's say like 300 uh, hertz or something. But we're not allowed to communicate in 300 hertz. So what we do is that we, we modulate the signal, which means that we shift the signal in the frequency domain using a carrier frequency, a specific carrier frequency. And this carrier frequency is the frequency that we are allowed to use for communication. So instead of 300 hertz, we push it to 2.4 gigahertz or something. And we call this an RF signal, radio frequency signal. So, uh, <clears throat> so in the transmitter, there is a baseband. There is baseband where we have to, we have to uh, push the signal in the frequency domain, get the frequency components that we need to use, and so on and so forth. And then 
The RF, what it does is that it pushes the signal in the frequency domain before we send it over the antenna to the uh, outside. We have to uh, uh, push it in the frequency domain to be, like in, in, in normal cases, the signal would be something like this. And this would be 300 hertz. Okay? But we cannot... Well, you, this signal, we have to use GSM or we have to use Bluetooth or we have to use Wi-Fi and so on and so forth. We cannot leave the signal like this for GSM or Wi-Fi. We, we have to modulate the signal, which means that we have to push it in the frequency range using carrier frequency 2.4 uh, gigahertz and move the signal to be in that range. So when the signal is pushed in that range, now we can send it over the antenna to the outside. So we are... Uh, following, we, we are abiding by the frequency range that we are allowed to use for communication, and uh, the way to do that is through analog modulation. We call it analog modulation. Okay? So there is digital modulation and analog modulation, which is what we will study in, in, in this course. So analog modulation is just a, a normal shift of frequency to the entire signal. So we get the signal, we push it in the frequency range. That's all we do. Okay? So these are the three representations of the signal. We have the amplitude time, and we have the uh, frequency domain representation, and we have the state or phase uh, state diagram. So once we, once we modulate the signal, now we can send the signal through the antenna. So now what we need to, uh, to understand is that how the antenna actually represents this analog signal um, to the outside. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, the antenna design is another, uh, you know, aspect of research, which normally we don't do. Uh, but antenna represents the analog signal using electromagnetic radiation. It represents the analog signal using electromagnetic radiation. So it, it converts the analog signal with the amplitude and everything into electromagnetic field around the antenna, okay? And hopefully this electromagnetic field will, uh, uh, will have specific energy in different locations, and then we get this electromagnetic wave on any re receiver with another antenna, which converts the electromagnetic wave back to to an actual analog signal and then we get this analog signal and then we do the baseband community or from rf we do demodulation we convert it back to baseband and then from baseband we do channel estimation or sorry we do signal detection and and we we get back the digital uh, signal okay you have a question do you, any question okay so so the simplest way of uh, uh, antenna, which is what we call um, isotropic radiator. Isotropic radiator, from the name, it actually radiates electromagnetic fields in all directions equally, which means that the antenna itself uh, radiates. So it takes the signal and then radiates the signal into electromagnetic wave in all directions with the same strength. So that's like it's like a, 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 a sphere. So if you look at it from any angle, you will find that the electromagnetic pattern is like a, a, a circle. So from the x, y, z direction, it's actually a a spherical uh, uh, electromagnetic pattern, okay? So, and of course, the electromagnetic uh, field strength itself represents the analog signal amplitude and, 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 and so on. So, what we need to do now is that the isotropic radiator or the isotropic antenna is an ideal antenna that almost never exists. It almost never exists. 
So there is always some hardware imperfection that will uh, 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 make the electromagnetic radiation around the antenna not as ideal as we think it would be. Okay, so there is no such thing that uh, we have isotropic antenna in in reality. <coughs> isotropic antenna is like a a point, and it radiates in all directions at the same time, which is not possible. So, what we what we have is um, what we have is always directive effects. So we always have some directive effects, which affects the electromagnetic pattern to become non circular at least in a specific um, domain as we will see in a moment so this is some examples of uh, some uh, 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 antenna and this antenna is like you know the the antenna that we have in the car that we used to have in cars in old cars mm -hmm. the one that we just pull it up mm -hmm. so this is like this what happens is that uh, either either you feed um, we call it dipole antenna. Either we feed this antennas like we feed it from we feed the, 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 the antenna from the middle or we feed it from from the bottom. Okay? From uh, the we have to know now that this dipole antenna, which has a specific length here and a specific length here, we are not we don't have ultimate flexibility for a specific length of this antenna, okay, uh, for efficient communication. And that's why, you know, like in, in the old cars, in order to have any good quality radio, what we do is that we have to pull the antenna up, right? What we're doing is that we're essentially controlling the length of the antenna to be <coughs> pi over 4. So for efficient radiation through the antenna, the length of this part and the length of this part needs to be very close to the wavelength of the, in the signal that you're trying to send divided by 4. Doctor, how exactly does this dipole antenna looks like? The dipole antenna is like a uh, post, kid. It's just like a, just yeah, a just rod. a rod, a rod, but it's metallic rod, and it, when you pull it up, um, it's it stands. Okay, like right? old radios. Have yes, it's like old radios. Yes, this is the one. Then right. Uh, what is this? I, I will I will talk about this. Forget oh, about yeah. this for now. I'm just uh, trying to focus on the fundamental aspect of the pull antenna, and then I will talk about. So what happens is that when you feed the signal from the middle. The length, this length is pi over 4, and this length is pi over 4. If you feed, uh, there is like uh, some dipole antenna, which is, you feed it from, from the bottom, and then it goes up. So in that case, this would be pi over 4. So you have only pi over 4, okay? But ideally, you can have pi over 4 up and down. But in any case, what we're trying to say here is that the length of the antenna is proportional to the wavelength of the signal. And that's why we said, if you have you if you have very long wave, you need to have okay. proportional size of the antenna. So, going back to the low the uh, the very low frequency communication, we said that the wavelength is like one million meter, right? Mm -hmm. So you have you need to have one million over four antenna size okay. in order to have efficient communication. Mm -hmm which in many cases is not, is not actually uh, feasible. And that's why we cannot use it on cell phones. We cannot use very low uh, frequency uh, communication on cell phones because then, then you, will, you will never be able to get good communication. Okay? So the feed, from the feed to the top of the antenna, you have a, a, a pi over 4. So what happens is that when you feed the signal to the antenna, the radiation pattern look, looks like this. The radiation pattern looks like this. Okay? So, uh, it, could be, it could be only from one side. Okay? Or both sides. So, if it's from one side, it looks like this. 
okay if it's from one side it looks like this but it's not so from from the top from the top it's like if it's like this sorry if it's like this if you look at it from the top it would be circular right so if it's if it's if it's a dipole like this if it's two lobes mm -hmm. two electromagnetic we call them lobes mm -hmm. If we have electromagnetic lobes like this, yeah. in the uh, in the top it will be like circular. The lobes also radiating the radiation pattern. Yes, will be circular. the radiation pattern mm -hmm. exactly. The radiation pattern would look, but it's it's not as ideal as the isotropic antenna because the, it's not realizable. The isotropic antenna in in reality is not realizable. Okay, so it's it's not possible. Um, so you have you have some lobes, which means that you have to have some directive aspect in the uh, in the antenna. So they use that uh, notion to uh, design directive antennas in um, in base stations. So if you look at base stations, the base station towers, mm -hmm. have you looked at any yeah. base station tower? You always find that you have a tower like this, and then there is always um, set of antennas mm -hmm. around it okay mm -hmm. you see like there are multiple antennas around it each one of these direct the radiation pattern into certain direction <clears throat> okay so you have multiple antenna and each one directs the lobe the the, the radiation lobe into a specific direction okay so this way, <coughs> you can radiate in all directions. You can radiate the electromagnetic wave in all directions, which allows you to use communication in all directions at the same time. That's why the direction for base station communication, the direction is not important. If we are here or here or here or here, we get, we get communication through the base station. Why? Because the... The base station uses what we call sectorized antenna. This is called sectorized antenna. It's actually multiple of them in different directions. It's like it creates, sometimes they call it array antenna, sometimes they call it circular antenna or sectorized antenna. What they do is that they, they, they create these lobes in a specific direction which covers all the 360 degrees. Okay? So you can allow, you can have direction, uh, sorry, you can have communication in all directions. But now, when we, when, we, when, you, when we communicate from here, do we use this antenna or we use this one or what? That's the question now. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have a device okay. here mm -hmm. which is trying to communicate to the base station. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. We have another device here which tries to communicate to the base station. Okay? okay? Mm -hmm. So, w when, when that one sends wireless signal, w we know that the wireless signal fades, and so you will actually get a copy of the signal on this antenna and a copy of the signal on this antenna, and so on. So the idea is that, are we using all the antennas mm -hmm. for reception, or are we using one of them, or what? Where the signal is more received from. Let's see. So, th this is a this is an area of research on its own. So this is called diversity. So, diversity of the wireless signal. So because of the multipath fading, we receive uh, different copies of the wireless signal on the different antenna. Okay. And remember, as we said, these wireless. Uh, uh, signal copies are delayed a little bit. So there is some phase shift between them. Okay? So this is this is an issue now. So should we should we select one antenna for reception at this point in time and ne neglect all the other antennas? Or what? Let's see. Okay? But what we learn from this slide is very important. We know that the, the size of the antenna is proportional to the wavelength of the signal. 
right? And no matter what we do, we have to have some directive aspect to the uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation from the antenna because the ideal as a tropic antenna is not realizable in practice. So we have to have some directionality, which drags us to the fact that we use sectorized antenna for base stations. Okay, so, so these are the facts we have at the moment. So now, using this diversity aspect, so we have, we have, as we said, due to multipath fading, now we receive copies of the wireless signal, which are different in phase, right, on these uh, antennas. Remember that some of these copies, they may have reduced power, and some of these copies will definitely have some phase shift. So the question now, how can we allow the reception of the wireless uh, signal on a sectorized or a cellular, a cellular or an array or antenna array? So there are two uh, categories of mechanisms. One is called switch diversity. By switch diversity, what I do is that the, uh, uh, the antenna receiver will actually get the uh, uh, the signal from all antennas okay and select the one with maximum power as simple as that so it will go through all the different antennas all the sectorized antennas and then see the power in the in the signal received and then selects the one with the maximum power this is very simple and neglect all the other ones neglect all the other ones. This is called switch diversity or selection diversity. Okay? So we, we, we receive only from one antenna. So what's good here is that I will not go through the issues related to phase shift of the different copies of the wireless signal, right? Because I'm selecting only one copy, I'm receiving only one copy. So the advantage here is that I'm, I don't have to deal with the different uh, uh, multipath fading copies and I don't have to deal with the frequency, uh, sorry, the, the phase shifts. So what is the disadvantage here? What do you think is the, is, is the disadvantage for the switched case? It has to check all the signal strength of coming from various and then to select Right. Okay. So that's a good point. So first I have to check all the signal strength or the power on all the antenna. So I have to, I have to, I have to, every time I have to, to, to check all the signal strength on all the antennas before I select anyone. So it's O of N. It, the complexity for this is O of N where n is the number of antennas, right? So it's O of n uh, operation, right? So what else? The, the, okay, so if I receive only, only from one antenna, I'm receiving a certain amount of power. But imagine if, if I were to uh, receive from all antennas at the same time, and I get the summation, okay, I would be able to receive higher power, hopefully, because I'm, I'm adding signals to each other. Okay, the challenge here is that you would think that when you when you receive from all the antennas at the same time, the amount of power will be increased. But as a matter of fact, because of the phase shift, you could actually introduce some degradation to the wireless signal because if the phase shift can actually cancel each other. Right. So this is this is a big issue now. Okay. So. So there is another category which is called diversity combining, which tries to uh, benefit from the fact that if I receive from all antennas, I would be able to sum all the signals. But I should be careful now that before I do this, I should do some co-phasing. <coughs> I should be co-phasing, which means that I should actually introduce 
some phase shift to some copies of the signal before I add them up. Which means that if I have, if I have two copies of the signal, one is like this and one is like this. So I, I, can, I can shift this to, to be in line with this and then I add them. Mm -hmm. So then and only then, I can combine them both and I get 2p, two p, two, two, double the power or triple the power or, or at least 1.5 the power. So I'm, I can actually get more power, which again enhances the reception, right? But this, the, 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 what's good here, and this is a good point, is that this is not O of n, this is O of 1. But in a, in a way, it's not, it's not O of 1, because again, I have to, to introduce some phase shift to some copies of the signal. So it's not O of 1. But hopefully it's not O of n, because you don't have to phase shift every single copy of the signal. But soft, soft com or diversity combining is... Uh, 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 is actually is much better and much efficient compared to uh, switching diversity. Okay, so it definitely, as you can imagine, it produces uh, uh, much better results in terms of uh, reception quality. Because if you combine multiple copies of the wireless signal, you can increase the reception power. But you have to you have to. You have to do some co-phasing to be able to do this. And this is how it looks like. So this is how it looks like. So if you have... <coughs> so what, we, what we're essentially talking about here is what we call MIMO. MIMO talks about multiple antenna, whether this is a sectorized antenna or maybe antennas that are used uh, for different frequencies or something. You have multiple uh, uh, antenna at the input and multiple antenna at the output, or the receiver and, uh, and transmitter. So we can use several antennas at the receiver or and the transmitter. So there is, uh, there could be like uh, multiple single or single multiple or multiple multiple. So I can use one antenna at the sender, multiple antenna at the receiver or multiple antenna at the sender, one antenna at the receiver, right? Or I can use multiple, multiple, okay? Uh, when you use one single antenna, what is the point of having multiple antenna at the receiver? Well, we can benefit a lot because remember, just the fact that you're using a single antenna at the transmitter, it doesn't mean that you will receive one copy at the, sorry, what, what, just, just the fact that you are sending one from one single antenna, it doesn't mean that you will receive one single copy at the receiver because of the multipath failing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the signal will, will go into different directions and will definitely deflect and reflect and you, you get a different, co you get multiple copies at the receiver. So if you have multiple receivers, at the, at the, if you have sorry, multiple antennas at the receiver, you, you will be able to use soft combining or diversity combining or switch diversity and so on and benefit from the fact that there are multiple copies of the signal, mm -hmm. right? So just the fact that you have one single antenna at the transmitter, it doesn't mean that you have to have one uh, uh, single antenna at the receiver. So you can have one to M or M to one or M to M, okay? So what is the advantage in having uh, M transmitters and one receiver? What is the point? If one transmitter and many receivers, there's an advantage. Right. That, but many transmitters and one receiver. We'll talk receiver. about it now. Oh, we'll talk okay, about okay. this now here. Oh, okay. Here. So this is M. Sorry. So this is M. And we want to maximize the signal reception at this point. They call this beam forming. Beam forming is like you have multiple antennas at the transmitter, okay? And you want to maximize the performance of signal reception at a certain point. This is cool. It's like it's as if you want to 
beam form is like you want to focus the beam on this particular location so what we do is that we have the sender would have multiple antennas right and if we if we were to send the same the same uh, uh, signal imagine just if that we we send the same copy of the signal from the multiple antennas here okay so we send from antenna one we send and i know that if i were to send the wireless signal from antenna number one the wireless signal will take t1 this is the time duration will take around t1 time to reach to this point okay if i send from t2 the and the, the wireless signal will go hopefully in 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 in, in a straight line or um, one copy of the signal at least it will go in a duration of time t2 okay and from from 3 it will take t3 so assuming that t1 is the is the is the lowest okay and we have t2 equal to t1 plus certain distance which is the difference between 1 and 2 and d3 which is the difference between uh, uh, t1 and t3 so this is you can think of this as the phase shift or the shift in the signal that I send from uh, uh, 2 and 3 with respect to 1 it's like you are taking antenna 1 as the reference point and then 2 and 3 are shifted by d2 and d3 okay by distance or by phase hmm? The by distance, distance or by phase, you can, it's special, special is which which is related to distance. Okay. okay. Um, so in that case, what I could do is that I can from the transmitter, I can send a copy of the signal at time t zero, and I from. From antenna number two, I can send a shifted copy of the signal at time T0 minus D. What will happen is that the copy of the signal will arrive here in sync. Because D2 is the difference between antenna two and antenna one. Right? So it's like uh, uh, the signal. The signal is like this. And if I send it from D2 with no, uh, 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 with no phase shift, it would be like, it will be shifted a little bit. It would be like this. Okay? So what happens is that I will, I will send it earlier. It's as if I'm pushing this in the time domain that when it goes here, they will be in sync. When they are in sync, you can receive them using one antenna from one location. And at this point in time, they will be in sync. But you have to adjust this time. You have to adjust these times very carefully. Okay? So when you adjust these times very carefully, what you essentially do is that you maximize the, re the reception at this point exactly. So this is what they call beam forming. <coughs> so you are focusing multiple copies of the signal to be exactly in sync at certain location. Mm -hmm. When they are in sync at, at certain location, you maximize the, the reception at this point. Remember that if you move a little bit further, they, will be, uh, they, they may be out of sync again because these do, D2 and D3, they will be different at this point in time. So they may go out of phase again and you, you, you may not have good reception quality at this point in time right so d d2 and d3 are special parameters these are related to distances okay so which which actually uh, uh, corresponds to this distance or this time difference okay so this time difference you know that the uh, uh, 
this is like the propagation time is proportional to the distance in the in the spatial domain okay so what i'm essentially trying to do here is that i'm trying to focus the beam multiple copies of the same wireless signal into one location <coughs> so this is the case that you just talked about is that if i have m antenna on the transmitter and one antenna the receiver i can use beam forming to maximize the so the other way around if i have one and m i can do some diversity combining to combine and again get a uh, 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 higher power and higher reception quality okay or i can get m and m in which case i can have uh, some like matrix and uh, and i can combine from here and combine from here so i have many to many relationship which is the ultimate ultimate difficulty so maimo talks about um, some using some um, special diversity or special uh, multiplexing special multiplexing here talks about using the multiple antennas not to send the same copy of the signal we what we do is that we get the wireless we get the 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 uh, the data that we want to send and split the data into different rates and send different different data on different antenna so we split the high rate signal into multiple lower rate uh, streams so in that case we're not using the same copy of the signal but we're using high instead of sending high rate signal because sending high rate signal we may get very large bandwidth so in order to control the bandwidth we can send the high data rates on different antenna in which case we need to have m antennas on the other side to be able to receive all the different signals and then we need to combine them at the receiver okay and get the original signal so beam forming talks about sending the same copy of the signal and maximize the reception at certain location special multiplexing talks about splitting the high rate signal into multiple lower rate signal okay and transmit over different antennas what is the the problem if you use different signal on different antenna what is the problem here well the problem is that these different signals these are different signals remember so they will interfere with each other they will interfere with each other if they are sent on the same frequency range right so if they are the same copy of the signal and they are sent on the same frequency range on the country we can benefit from that using beam forming because we can again combine them co-phase them and in that case we maximize the high the, the reception quality but if they are different signals then they will interfere with each other so we know that so what we could do in that case we can use the special diversity we can send we can send different signals on different directions okay and we can use different antennas to receive the different signals so we send the signals using directed antennas such that the the signals will not interfere with each other even if they are using the the same frequency if we're using the same frequency but sending the wireless signal in two different directions then the energy of the two signals will not mix because they are directed similar to if you were to think about line of sight so it's like you're focusing in a specific direction but in that case you need to have antennas in different direction and be able to receive the different signals and combine them all together to get the high data rate signal so you can use sectorized antenna and you can benefit from special multiplexing or if special multiplexing is difficult you can use what we call diversity coding 
diversity coding, you can send different copies of the signal with the same frequency, but using what we call different uh, 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 codes. We call them orthogonal codes. Uh, and that's, that's, this concept is used by uh, code division multiple axis or CDMA. So we'll study CDMA later on. So CDMA allows two signals to send at the same time on the same frequency and yet they don't interfere with each other. So you might ask yourself, how, how can we do this? It's the same, two different signals. They are sending on the same frequency at the same time, yet there is no interference. So how does this happen? So I will, I will, I will stop at this point and not give you more details about CDMA until we actually study CDMA later on. So uh, you just need to know for now that diversity coding does not use special multiplexing. It does not benefit from the special uh, characteristic, but it actually sends two different signals at the same frequency, at the same time, but using different, we call them orthogonal codes. In that case, the two signals will not interfere with each other. And we'll see how this is done later on. Okay? So these are the different techniques using multiple antennas. So today we talked about the antenna design. We talked about signals. We talked about antenna design. Okay? We talked about azeotropic antenna, and we said that azeotropic antenna is idealistic and it's almost never realizable in practice. And then we talked about the dipole antenna, and we said that this is a more practical realization of an actual antenna, yet it has some directive aspect, and we can benefit from this direct directive aspect to design a, se a sectorized or uh, a circular uh, antenna that has direction uh, that has specific direction, and then we can use different combining techniques, whether it's switched diversity or uh, combining uh, or diversity combining, and we can use as well some uh, beam forming or special multiplexing and diversity coding to send different signals, or we can divide the signal into different signals with different rates and send them across the different antennas and use some either special diversity or um, coding diversity to be able to receive the, the signal on the other side. Okay? Any questions? After this, uh, if you use uh, multiple antenna mm -hmm. as at the transmitter and mm -hmm. multiple antennas at the receiver, mm -hmm. the, the power will be the same. Like, the power? The power, uh, if we transmit to a particular power, uh -huh. we receive the power same here or... Uh, no, it, it depends. It depends. Uh, remember that if you have M and M, mm -hmm. what you are essentially <coughs> receiving at the, at the receiver side, not necessarily one copy of the signal. Mm -hmm. Because again, you have to deal with multipath fading. fading. Even here, we have to deal with multipath fading. Yeah. But we're, we're just trying to at least maximize the reception based on, the, on, the, on, on one path only of the signal. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the same copy of the signal. And we're just controlling the phase shift from the sender side to maximize the reception at the receiver. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. But if you have M and M, mm -hmm. you can have different flexibility and different degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. You can have the informing, you can have diversity combining, coding, special multiplexing, you can have all of this and you can reconfigure the different antennas at the sender and at the receiver to do some of these techniques that we just talked about. At you the can, center means? Uh, uh, at what? Uh, at the center means? So any other no, if you have M antennas here and M antennas at the receiver, okay. then remember here, even though we have M antennas at the receiver, but we did not, we, we actually used one antenna only. Yeah. Just trying to simulate that if we have a user at this location, we want to maximize the reception at this location, regardless of all the other locations. So we want to maximize the reception at a certain location, right? Uh, but the receiver could have multiple antennas or multiple users. Each one has one single antenna. Okay? That's also my move. Okay? So we want to maximize the reception here 
or here or here. So we can do beam forming and we can reconfigure this mm. to do beam forming at any location. Okay? So if you have M and M, you can have, you can have different combinations of all the techniques that we talked about. Mm. Um, whether beam forming, whether uh, diversity combining, uh, special multiplexing, diversity coding. So you have all the flexibility from the transmitter side and the receiver side. Okay? Um, if you have one here and many here, then uh, here the signal strength will be split and given to the audio. The, if, even if you have one here and, and many here, yeah. we can benefit from the multipath fading, hmm. right? Hmm. Because just the fact that you have one antenna here, it doesn't mean that you receive one copy. Hmm. But you have different uh, 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 fading copies hmm. from the same wireless signal. Hmm. So also in that case, you have to deal with the fact that you have... You, you are receiving multiple copies, mm. and these multiple copies are not necessarily in phase. Mm. So you have to possibly receive them from uh, uh, each antenna, mm. and then if you use switch uh, diversity, mm. if you switch diversity, mm. then you can say, or selection diversity, what you could do is that you can um, go through all the antennas and say, the one that has the maximum power, I will receive from that antenna and neglect all the other uh, antennas or you can say no I will combine all of them but I will make sure that all of them are in phase so how to estimate the phase difference this is this is we didn't talk about this but this this is done using some statistical uh, 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 techniques we didn't talk about it because this is very complicated mm -hmm. okay so uh, assuming that we know the phase difference the phase shift so we will co-phase all the, the received copy from multiple antennas and we combine all of them. Mm -hmm. But before we do this, we have to make sure that they are in phase. Mm -hmm. So we have to deal with all the phase shifts before we combine them. And this is called diversity combining. Okay? Mm -hmm. So here, beam forming talks about the fact that if you have M antennas at the sender and you want to maximize at certain antenna at the receiver or at certain location. If you have M and M, then you have all the combinations available for you. You can, you can do beam forming, you can do special multiplexing, diversity combining, you can do all of this. Mix of all of this. So will 1 to M reduce the power that is... Uh, hmm? Will uh, 1 to M, like 1 transmitter and M receivers, right. uh, the power will be split to all the individual... Right, yeah, because remember, when you, when you uh, radiate power in different directions... Yeah, it is split it's split. Yeah. The power is split. Yeah. Okay, and that's why we, we, we lose... We, the received power is not similar to the transmitted power. Yeah. Of course, yeah. we, receive, of, we receive... And this is the challenging... W w w this is the, big, the biggest challenge about wireless is that the reception power is much less compared to the transmission power. And that's why we have to increase the transmission power to increase the range. Mm. Okay? Mm. So the transmission uh, power radiates in different directions. So in one direction, you actually receive reduced power. And not only that, power gets distributed specially and across the distance. Mm -hmm. Because again, power uh, 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 loses its strength when it goes through further distance. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And it loses again its strength when it goes into different directions. Okay, so what we're trying to do using the diversity combining is that when we receive more copies, if we combine them without any special handling, then you, we, they can cancel each other because the, 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 the multipath fading will create out of phase copies of the signal. So when you combine them, you will actually lose. You will not gain anything. So in order for you to gain, you have to, you have to do some Phase shift, uh, phase shift to okay. some copies and create in phase copies of the signal and then and only then you can combine right. them to get the benefit of increasing the reception power okay but this MIMO is, is really big and it, it was introduced starting from uh, third generation so, so starting from 3G they have introduced MIMO as part of the standard as, as a very very important component and it's, uh, it's since then, it has really uh, 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 introduced very 
big, it actually affects what we call here spectral efficiency. Remember, we talked about spectral efficiency that we said using the same bandwidth, we can send higher data rates. Okay? You could do that using MIME. But if, you're using, if you are using single antenna and single antenna, then the multipath fading will create some uh, uh, channel impairments for you. you can, it, it, it actually creates some degradation in the wireless signal. And you're not doing any special handling at the receiver okay, to combine the multiple copies of the signal because you have only one antenna. So you're not using any special aspect to benefit from this diversity of the signal. In that case, the reception quality will not be as good as if you have multiple antenna and you will receive multiple copies at different locations and do this phase shift combined. In that case, the reception quality will be very high. So the, <clears throat> the probability of successful reception will increase, right? Which means that you can increase the data rates using the same channel bandwidth. And this is what we call the spectral efficiency. So spectral efficiency talks about the fact that using the same channel bandwidth, we can increase the data rates. So this can, uh, one, of the, one of the ways to achieve this is, is through mining. Another way, of course, is to use uh, a special design for the antenna or use sectorized antenna. Or sectorized antenna is, is essentially mine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Another, of course, uh, way which is, uh, we will study later, which is through modulation. So you can use digit specific digital modulation, and we will see that using specific techniques on digital modulation, you can increase this, the, the spectral uh, uh, efficiency as well. So spectral efficiency talks about the fact that using the same bandwidth, you can really increase the probability of successful reception. Because if you don't do this, multipath fading will affect, will degrade the signal, and you will get lower <coughs> probability on uh, uh, receiving good signal at the receiver, which will not allow you to send high data rates. So in that case, using the same bandwidth, you are receiving, you are actually sending back and forth low data rates, okay? So this is low spectral efficiency. But using MIMO, using special digital modulation techniques, special digital uh, tada, uh, channel coding techniques and so on, you can increase the spectral efficiency. Higher link robustness means? Which means increasing the success of uh, reception. Robustness talks about the fact that you increase the the probability of successful uh, 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 reception at the receiver side. Okay. But reduced fading here, reduced fading here does not necessarily reducing the fading itself, but re reducing the effect of fading. In fact, we can benefit from fading because using diversity combining, I'm actually benefiting from the, from the multipath fading. Mm. Right? Because mm -hmm. I, I have multiple copies of the same signal with some phase shift. I was able to, to do some co-phasing and in, okay. uh, combine them to increase the reception power, which will lead to high probability of reception, which increase the robustness, and also increase the data rates using the same bandwidth, which affects the spectral efficiency. So these are matrix, by the way. Uh, spectral efficiency is a matrix. We can measure spectral efficiency by the amount of data rate you send on a specific bandwidth. So the more data rates you send on, on the same bandwidth, the more spectral efficiency. Which means that you have a specific bandwidth available for you, and you are sending higher data rates. On the same bandwidth, so this is good. So that's what, what, what happens from first generation to second generation to third generation, because from... 1G to 2G to 3G, we're not increasing the bandwidth, but we're increasing the spectral efficiency using special techniques in uh, like MIMO, like digital modulation techniques, like channel coding techniques, and so on and so forth. So from 1G to 2G to 3G, what we are doing is that we are, we are introducing more sophistication on these techniques, which allows us to increase spectral efficiency. Okay. 
enough for today. Yeah. <laughs> More than enough, huh? <laughs>